Uh, thanks, Ari, for that wonderful introduction. Um, as noted, we met at a Adidas meetup here at Western Row uh, about two months ago. And so I'd love to give my presentation that I gave there, entitled Chatting with a Podcast, Retrieval, Augmented Generation, and Databricks. Now, one of the things that is really cool at Western Row is that we have this podcast called This is Digital. Um, it's put out, I think, either bi-weekly or monthly. And I wanted to create a digital chatbot where clients could come and interact with the, with the podcast to answer questions like, you know, what are Westboro's West main offerings? Can you tell me more about the industry um, that they're talking about? And so the goal of this presentation will be to make a chat, make this chatbot using Databricks, uh, using the Databricks platform here. And so the end result should be something like this, where I can pose a question like, what is Westboro's perspective on AI? send it to an endpoint, and it's going to give back uh, a custom tailored answer to um, the information that's provided in the podcast itself. And so over this presentation, I uh, will talk about a few key takeaways. One, we'll again create that chatbot uh, using, you know, answering questions based on what clients have at Westbound's perspective. We'll do that leveraging retrieval augmented generation or RAG architecture in the Databricks, back, or Databricks, uh, Databricks platform itself. And this RAG architecture, again, allows for the specification of large language models. Uh, Databricks also provides a lot of out-of-the-box metrics to assess the quality and track these metrics, which I think is something that is not talked about enough in terms of assessing, you know, how good is my chatbot, how good is my conversation here. Uh, we'll go over first the introduction, the background, helping viewers view, build an intuition about RAG architecture. And then we'll go through the data preparation, embedding, prompt engineering and evaluation, deployment and tracking. And then we'll go a little bit tangential and talk about integrating some open source packages for more advanced RAG architectures and how the different features in Databricks allow for this integration in a very seamless manner there. One thing I will note is that I based a lot of this presentation on this tutorial from Databricks and their website. So if you want to check out more or want to go through some of these steps yourself, I highly recommend copy and pasting this link over there. So if we go back to our business question here, uh, you know, we want to set up a podcast or we set up a chatbot around the This Is Digital podcast. I see two paths that you could take forward here. One is retraining the model from scratch. So this would involve hiring a team of PhDs with a lot of expertise in LLMs, building a huge data set with billions of tokens, leveraging huge amounts of compute resources and time. And at the end, you get a very finely tuned model endpoint that is very specific to that use case. Um, but again, had a lot of this overhead in terms of cost and hiring. The other option, which we'll again talk about in this presentation, is something called retrieval augmented generation. This is where we take relevant documents, embed them and store them in a special database called a vector database, set up a custom prompt, connect a bunch of things together, and end up with a model endpoint that's not as finely tuned as the training from scratch, but we arrive there in a much faster way um, with a lot of the same functionality there. And so while, you know, retrieval algorithm generation and, and sort of training model from scratch are two routes, there's obviously a bunch of different combinations or different methodologies you could take here um, from fine tuning to prompt engineering, again, to RAG architecture. Uh, like most things, they have their advantages and disadvantages that are documented again on the Databricks website on the bottom, of, bottom right of the screen. Um, but one thing that we really think in terms of this perspective and for a lot of companies is that RAG architecture hits that sweet spot between being simple and fast to value while also providing a level of co customization um, that you get with pre-training or fine tuning here. Now, two things I'll note before moving on from this slide. One that I've sort of put a, a increase, I've re listed these in terms of increasing complexity. Um, but that complexity increase isn't linear. It's more exponential, logarithmic. So, you know, prompt engineering is relatively straightforward, while pre-training is obviously much, much orders of magnitude more difficult. The other thing is, is that these methodologies are not mutually, mutually exclusive. In fact, we'll actually use some elements of prompt engineering within retrieval augmented generation. And so what you really want to do is take these methodology, uh, methodologies and really tailor their tools to your specific your specific problem themselves. Now, before we get into RAG architecture and all these different things, I wanna help the viewer build an intuition about what is RAG architecture. And so I'll begin with an example that I'm sure a lot of us have done, where we've taken 
an entire document, copy and pasted it over in the chat GPT, or maybe Llama 2 or some other large language model, and it's asked it a question saying, hey, given the document above here, you know, tell me about what West Monroe thinks about AI. Now that's fine, and maybe you just have that one document's perspective. And so instead of one document, you can extend up to maybe four documents. You can copy and paste them over, and you can say, hey, given these documents, what does West Monroe think about AI? Now I'll give you maybe a little bit better answer, but if you look at these documents, this one, one of them talks about five product leaders you need to follow, um, which has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. And so we really need to adjust our prompt to say, hey, first look through the documents, pick the ones that are relevant, and then answer the question, what does the company think about AI? Now this is fine for you know two, three, four, depending upon your appetite for copy and pasting things over. But what happens if you had you know maybe a hundred documents or a thousand or a million documents here? You don't want to copy and paste those over again and again. And so what you can do is actually store it in a Databricks vector search index, which is a scale a searchable database that we'll discuss a little bit later. And then you change your prompt to say, hey, go look at this database, find the relevant documents, and then use that as a context to answer your question here. And so then this is uh, Databricks high level architecture about that, that's the sort of rag, um, rag setup here, where again, we're asking the question, what is West Monroe's perspective on AI? We then take that question and embed it and then go search that, uh, that very business domain specific database um, where we've loaded all our documents itself. Once we found the right documents, we'll pull that in um, and then add that to the actual prompt itself about, hey, given these documents that we found, ask the question. We'll then take that entire prompt and pass it to an actual large language model like Llama 2 um, on, on Databricks, or maybe you want to use ChatGPT or something from another company itself. And then it'll spit out the right an spit out an answer about, you know, Westboro thinks about AI is transformative and XYZ here. And like any data science project, a lot of the, the details are in the actual data preparation. So we'll start by looking at how do we actually create that business domain uh, database here and what, what sort of special transformations do we have to do to our business documents itself. So we'll start by going through the data preparation and something called embedding, which will help us kind of build that very easily searchable database itself. So just a quick aside for this specific business context where I was having working with a podcast, um, I found we upload everything to YouTube. I highly recommend you check it out. I pulled the MP3 file using a Python package called PyTube. I then use OpenAI Whisper um, to convert that MP3 file into a transcript and then store it in a Delta table itself. Um, and so this is just how I got that, the actual text file that we want to look at here. And so this is an example of, you know, I have the episode, the URL, and the transcript itself. But again, it's all stored in a Databricks ta data table itself. Now, once we have it, you know, the raw data, raw data collected, we want to clean the data set and then upload it to the searchable index here. Now, the searchable index needs to be very quick, right? When I'm having a conversation with somebody, I expect very quick responses. Likewise, when I'm having a conversation with a chatbot, I want very quick responses as well. And so one of the problems is that raw text is very hard to actually search over um, in a rapid manner itself. So we have to do something called embedding. And this is where you take text and you actually convert it to a long list of numbers called a vector. And to do that, you can use open source packages or whatever you wish. But this is where the power of Databricks really comes in. They have these open out of the box models. Um, you can see here they have you know, Llama 2, they have uh, you know, a, a, chat, a chat one. But they also have this embedding model that I can call into my Python code with a simple single line here. And then I can pass that function over all my text and provide and turn everything from, I'll turn all the raw text into an actual uh, vector. And so this is an example of the content and it sort of transformed into a vector index, or tra transformed into a vector uh, itself. Now, one of the issues you run into with long text is that it's very difficult to embed. Um, some, one of the reasons is that maybe you have the correct answer to what you're looking for is in the middle paragraph or something. Um, having all that extra text around it is actually going to provide too much noise to your answer itself. Um, there's also limits on sort of the embedding model about how much text you can take in it and take in. So to get around this issue, you can do something called embedding or chunking, where you split the text up into chunks themselves and then actually embed those chunks. Now, in this 
tutorial, all I did was just simply do a uh, kind of a, a fixed length where I separated the text apart and then I just embedded them themselves. Now this is, there's all different, a whole field of study and research here about what is the best way to chunk and do you do it on the paragraph? Do you kind of use, a, use another model to chunk here? Um, won't get into that in this presentation, but definitely something where if down the road, maybe my model isn't performing as well, this is a knob I can come back and really tune here. Once we have all those chunks ready to go, we have to essentially set up the house that we're going to fill. And this is creating the vector index or the vector search index database. Um, this is again done with a couple of lines of code that I pulled from the Databricks uh, documentation that's very easy to navigate. Uh, and then once that database is set up, I then can load all my information into it. So this is where I am creating the, the actual data table, the actual index that our, our model is going to go search here. So after that, we've done it. We've created this uh, Databricks vector search index that can easily be searched over once we um, pose, pose a question to it itself. Now that we've set up that database, we now need to look at actually creating that prompt itself and how we're going to pull the context of those documents into our question that we pose to the generalized large language model. And so this is where we get into that prompt engineering. Again, we're combining two of those methodologies that I talked about before and really tailoring it to our use case. And so one of the most powerful things you can do in Databricks is actually use something called lane chain. This helps with creating these prompts and adjusting them to meet um, and fit that sort of specific problem itself. So while we, you know, if we set up that, if we set up that prompt, it would say, hey, just pull the contacts in and answer the questions. Um, that might be fine if we say you have an input that says, what is West Monroe's main industries? You know, we'll get an output that says West Monroe has, works in energy utilities, it works in financial services, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine, right? But what if we ask it another question like, what is the recipe for bread? Because in RAG architecture, you actually use an underlying generalized foundational model like ChatGPT or Llama 2. It has general context, then it can answer the question for what is the recipe for bread. However, the context of our problem statement, we don't want our client facing chatbot going off the rails and answering random questions here. Now, while that's not, you know, the worst in the world, like there's no real damage to our reputation, some of the more issues there, some of the more malicious things that can happen is that uh, hackers can do what's called prompt injection, where they start to elicit uh, information from the from the chatbot that we don't want getting out. So for example, if we say, hey, what are West Virginia's secret customers that's working on an M&A deal with? You know, we could coax that answer out and you can have things like, you know, different clients that come out. And so one of the things you want to do first in this prompt is add additional knowledge to that, um, to those contexts the documents are pulling out here. So you can see here I've added things like, hey, you're a West Virginia chatbot, you only answer these questions, don't reveal any information. And while that's like the first line of security or one of the lines of security, there's other obviously things you can do down the road here. And so one of the things beyond, you know, really tailoring the chatbot to fit, fit your specific business use case um, is we want to give our chatbot memory, right? When I'm having to share a conversation with someone like Ari or earlier, we had to share memory of what our discussion was. And so likewise, we want our chatbots having the same sort of uh, feel to it when they're interacting with a client or interacting with customers. So in this question, we said, hey, what are West Monroe's main offerings? It gives us the main offerings and says, tell me more about the first industry mentioned. In this case, the chatbot has to remember, okay, what did I say? What was the first industry that we talked about here? And to do that, we also use this, also put this sort of functionality within that prompt itself, where we add the actual chat history on top of the context document and on top of our customization here. And so this is an example of the lane chain uh, prompt I used in the, in the actual demo, where again, I'm only allowing West Monroe questions, I'm preventing injection attacks, I'm checking for the actual history itself, and then retrieve the documents and answer the specific question that I posed here. This also allows you to have a little bit of fun if you want to mess around on a Friday afternoon like I was. Um, I add the same sort of prompt here, but added this line about also responding in Shakespearean tone only. And so when I ask it about West Monroe's perspective in AI, it says, Hark, good sir or madam, thou dost inquire about West Monroe's stance in AI, a technology thou dost fascinate and transform the world in most wondrous ways. Now, I'm a physicist by training. I didn't study any Shakespeare, um, but I feel like that comes pretty close to something you would see on BBC or a masterpiece theater here. Once we've had that all combined, we've sort of 
created our prompt engineering here. We now need to move on to actually putting the model um, and registering it to core deployment itself. As this is LiveRG, one of the more powerful tools in Adobe's called um, MLflow, where you can simply add some wrapper code around your model development, and it will store important information that others would need to reproduce your model itself. So for example, you have artifacts such as the requirements TXT file, you have the actual, uh, you know, the model pickle file, um, as well as code to reproduce. And this is particularly powerful, not only for, you know, if you need to come back and reference something later in your experimentation, but let's say another business, uh, business group wants to use your model, instead of you sending them an email with some code attached for it and they have to set up an environment and they et cetera, et cetera, they can simply open their Databricks environment, download this code um, and run it to reproduce it and start tailoring it to their own, their own specific, um, specific needs. So I think this is, as a data scientist by training, this is one of the more powerful tools um, that helps me really keep track of my experimentation and, and where I'm working in Databricks itself, um, both in generative AI as well as a little larger um, sort of more generic and more sort of traditional machine learning modeling. Once we've decided, hey, this is a model that um, these are some models that we want to work with, we need a way to actually evaluate the model. Now, for traditional models, doing something like precision or recall, um, RMSC, um, that's very easy and very straightforward to track. It's just a number. But then it begs the question, how do you assess the quality of a chatbot that you're having? How do you assess the quality of a conversation I'm having before? Um, and fortunately, West uh, Databricks provides a lot of different levels that you can, uh, or different levels of metrics that you can use to assess this quality here. Um, from out of the box metrics, from ML flow, to custom metrics that you can build and tailor towards your specific organization, to even using another model um, in a technique called LLM as a judge. And so these, obviously within anything, there's trade-offs. And so these are, again, increasing complexity of implementation here should always be thought about as you build these into your workflows. So for out of the box, um, it's just simple as just importing uh, these, importing these, uh, importing this functionality from MLflow and adding it to your, your run. Um, but for custom metrics, which gets a little bit more interesting, or let's say, you know, we at Westboro value professionalism. We wanna make sure that the responses that our chatbot gives, uh, give it in a professional manner here. And so what you can do is provide Things like an example, a score, definition, um, different ranges up and down the score here, um, and then put that into your actual training itself. And uh, MLflow will evaluate your model based on that and that answer itself. Now, the other and sort of third and most complex way to evaluate your model here is use what's called an LLM as a judge. And this involves creating a preset, you know, predetermined set of questions um, with predetermined answers running those predetermined questions through your model, getting some responses, and then using another model to assess the quality of, based on the predetermined answers, how good was their outputs from your model itself. And so this is an example of some inputs and targets, the model predictions, as well as answer correctness, and then you know, a classic out of the box um, metric itself here. So really showing kind of the range of things that you can assess the quality. Again, something I think is not talked about enough is we can put something out there that interacts with clients, but how do we make sure that uh, it's a good co conversation? How do we make sure that we're monitoring because there's any data drift or quality drift? Once we've determined which model is best for um, our application, we want to go into deploying and tracking. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. Um, you can simply, through a couple of lines of Python code, deploy it to what's called the Databricks model endpoint. Uh, this is a power, again, more powerful functionality from Databricks where once you create this endpoint, it's an API call that you can simply hit and kind of what I did at the beginning of this presentation itself. However, when you go through this process itself, just deploying the model doesn't allow for complete tracking. Yes, you can track things like logs and how often it was hit, um, but doesn't give you much more information past that. Instead, what we want to do is while we deploy it, is also create what's called an endpoint inference table. And this is done by just simply adding a little bit of code into the wrapper deployment code. Again, all documented and shown in the tutorial, as well as documentation on Databricks itself. Um, but basically designating a table about where you want to land both the inputs and the outputs of each interaction you have with the chatbot there. Once we've deployed this endpoint inference table, we can take it, compute the metrics that we, we use during evaluation, and then store that information into another table that we can then build a dashboard on top of itself. 
Um, so this is an example of a dashboard, kind of just one section of it, um, where we can look at things like the metric names, we're gonna have summary statistics, we can select a, a metric we wanna drill, on, drill in on based on time um, or, or over sort of multiple different iterations itself. Um, so again, really showing that while you deploy this model, you also wanna understand how is it doing in production and Dataverse provides a lot of good, great tools um, for that functionality. As after we've deployed that, we've done it. We've gone from completely raw transcripts from our podcast. We've cleaned it up, chunked it, put it in a vector search database, um, worked through creating our custom prompts that prevents against injection attacks and tailors our chatbot, um, then deployed our model using an endpoint inference table, processed the, the, the inputs and the outputs, and then tracked those over time to make sure that alerts us if things are getting out of whack or if we need to intervene or retrain at all here. Now, while we've done sort of the RAG architecture here, um, I had some time uh, while we were dealing with some issues and some bugs that I was working through in my code. I had a few weeks here that I wanted to uh, investigate some other ways to do RAG architecture, some more advanced uh, advanced ways to do, do these things. And so in this section, we'll talk about integrating some open source packages um, for more advanced RAG architectures. So in this talk, we'll focus on that one part um, where we take the we take the actual question and we go and search the, the vector search index here. Now, in the previous demo, in the previous part of this presentation, we used something called real-time similarity search, and we're going to swap that out for some more advanced ways to actually look through the database here. And so this, is, again, is taking that, that question and saying, okay, where in the database does this question match up to? What are relevant documents I want to find? To do so, we're going to follow uh, this deep learning course that I took on uh, deep, learning, deep learning AI, um, it's called building, you know, evaluating your advanced RAG architecture using Llama Index. Um, again, highly recommend you checking out uh, that tutorial if you're interested in, in more, in kind of getting into these more advanced architectures. And so a part of Llama Index, you can, you know, import everything. Um, but Llama Index, similar to our previous project, is that they want to use both a chat, chatting model as well as embedding model itself. And while I could easily use Databricks, I know, out-of-the-box models, um, I wanted to see, okay, what functionality could I do in terms of connecting to OpenAI? And fortunately, Databricks provides it, uh, makes it very easy to set up an API key and create a model serving endpoint where I can load in the OpenAI chat GPT model itself. So I think this is a really cool example where um, while you can do everything in Databricks, you can also mix and match what you want to do in there, giving you a lot of flexibility to tailor your solution or tailor um, your end product to what you need for the, the problem here. So the first sort of advanced retrieval uh, technique I'll, I'll talk about is something called sentence window retrieval. So we think about the question we could ask these transcripts, why did Exelon split into two companies? I could scan uh, the similar search would scan, it would find this document and would return all the documents, um, all the text that's on your left here. Now, while it's fine, you know, we do get the answer kind of in the middle of the paragraph here. So again, there's all these other text that I don't really want that provides a lot of noise in my answer here. So instead, what sentence which window retrieval does is that it'll scan through the text itself, find the very specific one or two sentences um, that answer the question, and then expand its window to make sure that it has a little bit of context around that sentence and only retrieve what's in color um, here. And so what that does is it gives you a much more granular response to your question and much more uh, high quality response itself. Now, as with anything, there's always trade-offs. This is obviously more computationally intensive because it has to do this additional scanning. But then you also gain um, a higher degree of accuracy and performance in your models itself. The last technique I'll talk about is called auto, auto merge, merging retrieval, where you can imagine if I have two documents, I'm gonna chunk them up, maybe into single documents, then into further chunks here. Um, you know, when I, when I originally look over the documents, I'll just kind of look at the individual chunks themselves. But what auto merging retrieval does is it creates a hierarchy that links these documents together. So for example, you know, the document you write, it links those four chunks together and says, hey, these four chunks are connected all together and create this one document. So what it means is that when it poses the question, it'll search and maybe let's say it, it finds, uh, you know, three of these chunks here on the right. Because it has that hierarchical link, it'll also return that fourth chunk as well as the single document under the, under the idea that, hey, if these three documents or these three chunks are relevant, this fourth chunk might also provide additional context that I'm missing here, and let's return the entire document itself. So again, being able to link these chunks together provides additional functionality and additional performance, um, increase in performance to your model. 
In summary, in the past 20 to 25 minutes, we've built this interactive chatbot based on the This Is Digital podcast from West Monroe, leveraging Databricks' powerful and robust infrastructure for LLM tracking, the evaluation, and deployment. We've also mixed in open source packages such as Llama Index, which allow us to really tailor our solution to fit the problem that we're trying to solve here.